Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's virtual field trip. Uh, do we have a treat for you today? This is my first little local collaboration with a conservation group here in the county. You all know I love the nature around here and I'm looking forward to this little field trip we're going to do today to learn a little bit about our river and some conservation efforts that are happening in this river. If anyone is new out there and the first time seeing me, so I am Dr. W40 or you can call me Wade and I stream live on Twitch, educational content focused on outdoor, nature, birds, wildlife, all this great stuff. So this sort of content today is right up my alley. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here. And now, what are we gonna do today? Apologies for the Honda Civic in the background. Um, <laughs> why is it always a Civic? <laughs> but, so today we are at the Marine Resources Council here in Melbourne, Florida. Um, I will let my guest do the introduction of what they do. Uh, so I will turn that over to her now. So here today I have with me Nicole Broquet from the Marine Resources Council or MRC. And Nicole, would you like to introduce yourself and a little bit about what you guys do here? Sure. Hi everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation and get to learn something cool. Um, as uh, Dr. Wade mentioned, my name is Nicole Broquet and I am the Director of Education at the Marine Resources Council. And we are a nonprofit dedicated to protecting and restoring the Indian River Lagoon through science, restoration, and education. And one of the most important things that we do that relates to our top tiers of programs is mangrove restoration. So we're gonna to start today off by talking about the marvelous mangrove. And mangroves are incredibly important because they are found uh, throughout the world in tropical and subtropical areas. So I don't want to, yeah. if you have any questions. Yeah. So yeah, just a little rundown of what we're going to do today. So we're starting here in their little mangrove nursery, which is awesome. So we're going to explore the three different types of mangroves. Uh, we're going to show off rain barrels, talk about the importance of rain barrels. Actually, someone told me the other day, they actually restrict the amount of rain barrels they can have in their state or county. Yeah, and, a lot of yeah. places do that. In some states, it's even illegal to have even one. That's That was news to me. That's just crazy. So we can talk about that a little bit once we get to the rain barrels. And then... <laughs> Lawn mowers are coming through. One second. So, after we're done talking about the mangroves and rain barrels up here, we are conveniently located right next to the Indian River Lagoon. So we're going to move down to the river. We're going to do go a little mobile and go down there and talk a little bit about the mangroves in the, liver, in the river and also talk about oyster beds. There's a couple oyster bed examples down there. Yep. And we'll talk about the importance of that and keeping the shoreline intact. And what you can do too, even if you don't live in Florida, uh, what you can do throughout uh, wherever you are, what you can do to help reduce your impact on our very important waterways. Yeah, so even though we're talking about this little important river here called the Indian River Lagoon, that doesn't mean this doesn't matter for you because what you do where you are will impact your local waterways and you can start thinking about things you could do to mitigate your effect on the environment around you because a green grass doesn't always mean a healthy. good thing. <laughs> a yeah, healthy environment. Mean, yeah, exactly. It means you dump a lot of fertilizer in it, which runs off into the waterways and causes too much nutrients and blooms of bad things. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, but first step today, we're going to talk about the mangroves. So I'm going to move off to the side and let Nicole go into a little bit more detail about the mangroves on this nice poster here. We're going to walk around the mangrove nursery and talk about it in a little bit more detail. All right, awesome. Oh, and before I do that, if you all have any questions during all of this, I will be loosely monitoring uh, chat, so feel free to ask live questions as we go through this. All right, awesome. Ooh. Thank you very much. All right, so um, we're gonna start off by learning about the mangroves in Florida. And Florida has three types of mangroves. They have the red mangrove, the black mangrove, and the white mangrove. People used to think the buttonwood uh, which it, it was a mangrove species, um, but it's actually an associated species, meaning that you can find it growing near mangroves, but it's not actually a mangrove. Um, so first, I want to draw your attention to this beautiful diagram here. Um, and what's great about this diagram is it really shows you the zonation of the mangroves. So the red mangrove is always going to be closest to the water and it's able to live in the water or in areas with high wave action because it has specialized adaptations um, that help provide it uh, support uh, when it is in an area of high wave action. And these are known as prop roots. So I'm going to show you a few examples of mangroves with prop roots later. 
and you can really see how they help the mangroves stand upright and provide that support uh, when there's heavy wave action, strong winds. And these mangroves, these red mangroves, are known as frontliners in Florida. However, in other uh, countries, such as the Philippines or Indonesia, the red mangrove is not actually known as a frontliner. It's kind of more of like a more mid-range one. That's because in other countries, like uh, in the Coral Triangle around uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, they have over 30 different species of mangroves. So they have mangroves that can live fully in the water, whereas the red mangrove is going to be a little bit more in the shoreline area. The next mangrove that we have in Florida is the black mangrove. And it's kind of in the middle. Um, it does get some wave action, but not nearly as much as the red mangrove. Um, and it gets its name because when it's a super mature tree, I'm talking 20, 30 years mature, its bark starts to get a lot darker, almost black. So that's why it's called the black mangrove. Um, and they have a special adaptation uh, known as nematophores, which I really enjoy saying, nematophores. And that's because, um, and these little special adaptations kind of act like snorkels. They look like a bunch of sticks coming out of the uh, muddy area where they grow. Um, and they help provide the tree with more oxygen. That's what you trip on. Yeah, <laughs> you trip on if you like see them hanging out, like you might step on them and they can spread really far. So you'll have nematophores everywhere in the natural environment. And then the last mangrove is the white mangrove. Um, and this one's going to be the furthest um, on, um, on the shore. And it's also going to be the most salt tolerant. This is because the waves are going to come up and down, up and down with the tides. And as the tide or the water is receding, it's going to leave behind salt. So this area of the soil can become three times as salty as the open ocean. So this area can get incredibly salty, which is amazing because if you know anything about growing plants, if there's any salt involved, typically plants are gonna die. That's one of the cool things about mangroves is that they can survive in a salty environment. Um, in our Indian River Lagoon system, it is known as a brackish environment, which is a mixture between salt and fresh water. I was just going to ask that. The yeah. Indian River Lagoon is salt. Do we find mangroves on the um, dunes as well? You should not find mangroves on the dunes. That's going to be a lot more like sandier soils. Mm -hmm. Mangroves are going to want to be in kind of uh, more like bay areas, areas where they're not going to have as much high wave action. Um, and they can live directly in full salt water um, or they can live in brackish water. Um, but you're not going to find them on a dune system because it's not going to have enough water to kind of keep that soil okay. moist. So I like that moving soil. And all those roots growing down in are really important for the riverbanks too, because it keeps them intact, prevents erosion. Exactly. And all that good stuff. Um, do I have a question here. Are uh -huh. mangroves monocotyledon, dicotyledon, or gymnosperm style plants? I am not a plant expert, so. I am not a plant expert <laughs> so. either, but um, I, well, they are dichotomous plants. Okay. They are trees <laughs> and uh, they produce very interesting seedlings or babies. And here are some pictures of them right here. They produce um, an offspring, for lack of a better word, known as a propagule. And what's really cool about these guys, uh, we have the red propagule here. Oh wow, they're all so different. Yeah, we have the black propagule here and we have the white propagule. Um, what's really cool about these guys is that they are fully grown plants, just like encapsulated in a smaller propagule. Oh, wow. They are viviparous, meaning that they do not need to, um, they're, once they drop off the tree, they mm -hmm. are ready to rock. And they, because being in a river, they flow everywhere. Yeah, it exactly. Helps moving around. Super important. So what's, um, again, what's really cool <laughs> um, is that the red mango propagule can survive in our environment for 365 days just floating around. Wow. Once it is kind of like ready to come to shore or once mm -hmm. it reaches the shoreline, this bottom part of it, the brown or red part, will get kind of more waterlogged. And instead of floating in the water kind of flat, it'll start to tip up. And I've actually seen red mangrove propagules just kind of hanging along in the water just like that. 
Um, the black mangrove propagules don't la uh, last as long. I want to say it's like 180 days max. Um, and then the white mangrove propagules, which look kind of like almonds, uh, they only last about 30 days. And each of these propagules has to stay in the water for a set amount of time. I don't remember the exact mm -hmm. amount, but they do have to stay in the water. Right. Um, and for everyone else, um, this is a penny right here, so it shows kind of like how small a lot of these things can be. We find lots of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Well, um, they knew the answer. They were just testing us. Oh. <laughs> well, how did we do? Did we do okay on the <laughs> yeah, answer? We were, we were correct. Oh, thank God. <laughs> well, you were. <laughs> All right. Oof. So now we have examples. We want to move over to there. You have all three. I want to show the start? baby ones over here. Okay. Okay. All right. So these are um, some of our red baby uh, propagules. You can see that a few of them have started to sprout already. Um, you, if you live in Florida, you are actually able to collect these propagules okay. uh, from the shoreline. If you see them in the water, do not collect them. If you these, see these are the red ones. So yes. these are the long bean looking ones. Yes. Yep. And so it'll look like this one. Yep. So you can see it looks kind of like a pencil or just a stick, honestly. <laughs> um, and so if you see them on the shoreline, you can collect them. Never, ever, ever pick them from trees. Uh, that is actually illegal and you can get fined for that. Um, so only if they're on the shoreline and do not have any roots sprouted or any leaves sprouted. But you can, if you find them just floating around without that, you can take them home and grow them. Yeah. In an area like this. And, or what's even easier too is that you take one that looks just like this. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that it kind of has the brown portion of the propagule right here. This is like the greener portion. It's a little yeah. hard to see with the lighting. Oops, you, you, I'll move. Okay. <laughs> you can stick it in a cup of water and put it in your windowsill. That's oh, nice. all you have to do. Change the water out every seven days. Okay. And once it starts to grow uh, leaves, probably looks something more like this one. Uh, it'll have leaves and roots. Then it can go into soil. And you don't have to grow it in a uh, salt water or even the brackish water, that. fresh water, right oh, wow. out of the tap. And then when you take it to the shoreline, is there any important thing you need to know when you move it to that? These guys are not ready to be planted yet. Okay. Yep, so um, we'll show you ones that are getting closer to being planted. Um, mm -hmm. When you're doing restoration, you want to make sure that your efforts are going to be the most efficient and most effective. Yeah, definitely. And so if they're not, you know, going to survive the wave action, then they're probably not right. Then, then we don't recommend putting them out. Um, one of the ways that you can identify these guys um, by uh, knowing that they're red mangroves when they're little, mm -hmm. if you're not very familiar with them yet, is checking out this spot right here. Oh, yeah. So you can see there's a nice green stalk coming out of it, and this is the original baby propagule. So this little nodge, nodule right here, that is going to kind of indicate that this was a red mangrove. And I'm going to show you a more mature plant that will show you that knob still. Okay, awesome. Cool. All right. All right, let's move down over to here now. Okay. So this one, right, this yep, bed right here? Guys. Yep. So we'll start off right here. So you can still see down here, this is the um, black baby propagule. It's kind of like that shell casing. It starts off as looking like a libum bean. And then once it's reached the shoreline, a little stem will grow from the base of it. And then the propagule itself will unfurl and then a stem and leaves will grow. So the way that I like to identify black mangroves um, is by looking at the underside of their leaves. You'll see that it's you know pretty nice, solid, waxy green here. Flip the underside. Oh, this one's not a very good one. Oh, ah. no. <laughs> Let's see if I can find another one. Yeah, oh, this is a good one. Okay, all right, so nice and deep green. Mm -hmm. Pale. It's pretty significant. So, um, especially when you're in a natural environment, you'll really see the difference um, between the deep green top side of the leaf and then the lighter green underside. Um, and then the black mangroves also have the ability uh, to suck up uh, the brackish water mm -hmm. and to maintain their osmoregulation. They will actually push salt crystals out onto the top of their leaves. Oh, interesting. And the salt crystals can be so large that you can even see them with your naked eye. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then lastly, this is the white mangrove. Um, and it kind of looks, again, the white propagule looks kind of like a almond. And then uh, once it grows out and you can start to see the leaves, you'll see a little dip right there. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And I like calling it um, kind of like a W, a stretched out W. W mm -hmm. for white. <laughs> That's how I like to identify them. Oh, that works. Yeah. Cool. 
So, um, if you are like, growing these, so mm -hmm. we have some bigger ones over there, you're not going to keep them at your house. You can keep them at your house for as long as you mm -hmm. want. Um, we, you do need to keep them wet, yeah. though. Um, and we recommend kind of keeping your mangroves for about three years or so. Um, we are always happy to come pick up mangroves okay. um, to help with restoration efforts. Um, and we do have a lot of volunteers that help grow mangroves at home. Did you hear that? If you're local, you can come volunteer. Yeah, <laughs> come grow some more mangroves. Let's see, and then I've got these guys over and here. And all of these, even the uh, whites, don't need to be in salt water if you're growing them at home? Correct. And wait, we only talked about growing... Those guys. Those so, guys, not the other ones. Those ones might not be allowed to, I don't know. So you can grow the black and the white mangroves mm -hmm. as well. However, they are, we find them more challenging. Um, we do work with a couple of schools that have been highly successful mm -hmm. at growing uh, black and white mangroves. Um, to grow the black and the white mangroves, you kind of have to make a mangrove lasagna. Oh, wow. You take a big metal pan, you put down a damp paper towel, put a sprinkle of propagules, damp paper towel, mm -hmm. sprinkle of propagules. You build a oh, whole wow. layer of it, wrap it in saran wrap, let it grow, wait for them to kind of like unfurl. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll have to kind of change out the paper towels or spray them occasionally to keep them nice and moist. And then once they've grown, grown roots, you can plant them in the soil. It's crazy. That's how difficult it is to do at a home setting, but they're able to do it just fine in the natural setting. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's, you'd think it'd be a lot easier to grow things at home. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but, but it's not. The red mangroves are super easy, though. <laughs> yeah, we love that mangrove lasagna term. Yeah, no, it's totally <laughs> Stacking true. Them all. Stack them up. And um, so we won't be able to see any black on any of these black mangroves because that doesn't happen until later in life. Yeah, so you won't so be able to see the black. And you honestly, look for the little W's. Nope. So this is a red mangrove. Yep, that one doesn't have the W's. Nope. I'm nope. trying to see if I can do the identification. Ooh, okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Ooh, should I line them up and you can guess? No, that, I'll get them wrong. <laughs> 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 we don't need to put myself through that. What do you think this one is? That one? Oh, that one has the things coming down like that. Mm -hmm. When do they start having the roots come out? Um, it depends on what their soils are like. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as a year or two, I would say. Okay. Oh. Huh. And this is probably like a three-year-old mangrove right here. Uh, red. Red! <laughs> yes, it I, is a red mango. Why did, why did you say that? It wasn't as white underneath the leaf. Great, great. Yeah. Yep, so and we also know that it is a red mangrove because the red mangrove is the only one with prop roots. Mm -hmm. And so you can already see that these guys are starting to grow some little baby prop roots. There we go, let's show the prop roots real quick. Yep, so here are the prop roots already growing out. And then this right here, that's that little nodule I pointed out earlier. Yep. yep, so here's the woody trunk of the original baby propagule. Here is the stem that had grown. Mm -hmm. um, and we are getting a little tight on time, okay. so. Yeah, let's, yeah, <laughs> okay. let's move through, yeah. Oh, all right, so, um, and then I also brought this guy out too, because you can see that even though he's like weird shaped, he can already start to grow his propagules mm -hmm. for stabilization. And then this guy I wanted to show because you can see that his stem was broken at some point, but mangroves are so resilient that he was able to recover and grow up just fine. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I told you, I did warn you that we can I chat know. forever about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, we're trying, so today we're trying to do as much as we can in one stream. We could come back out and hit these topics in more detail in future ideas, possibly. All right, cool, watch your step there. We got a white, we got our black over yep, there. Coming through, coming through. <laughs> Rain barrel time. Yep. All right, so these are our rain barrels. They're 55 gallon uh, food grade barrels. We cut the tops off completely, put mosquito netting over the top to prevent pests from entering the water. Um, and then we raise it off of the ground so that you get better flow out from the barrel. Mm -hmm. um, you can use your rain barrel water for watering your ornamentals. Um, you can use it for washing your car. Uh, you can use it for filling pools. Um, watering the grass, lots so, yeah, of other things. All those little things, what's the conservation significance of using rain barrels? Great question. So rain barrels help reduce our individual impact on stormwater pollution. Because we have so many impervious sur surfaces and we have uh, built so many buildings, we've removed a lot of our natural environment and our natural plants that used to suck up a lot of that rainwater. 
now stormwater is falling off of our roofs, going onto our roads, collecting all the pollution on the roads, uh, excess fertilizer, pet waste, plastics, um, even dirt or something natural like grass clippings. Those can all have an impact on the natural environment. Once the rain hits the storm or uh, hits the um, road, captures all that, flows into the lagoon, leads to excess nutrients in the lagoon, which causes algae blooms. That's not good around here. No, yeah, definitely not. Some people aren't familiar with our lagoon issues. We sometimes have algal blooms yep. that cause a lot of problems. Cause extensive fish kills and yeah. I have a question about this uh, one problem in Florida, mosquitoes. Yes. You might have hinted at this when you talked about the screen, but the screen is really important in mosquito prevention. Yes. Right? yes. Yeah. So because this is standing water, if you are not regularly, regularly <laughs> using your rainwater, um, you need to make sure that you have a good screen with no holes on it, preventing mosquitoes from entering into your water and laying eggs. Yeah. Yep. Is, is that why some states don't allow rain? Do you know why? I think some, oh, I'm, I'm just speculating, yeah. um, but I believe some states don't allow you to have a rain barrel because either they're not getting enough water in okay. general. Okay, so it's just, we have a runoff problem here in general where they, they might have more of a drought problem. They exactly. don't want people taking all the water, they want it in the soil. In a lot of different that states in the United States, they're going to have different soils. Yeah. Florida soils are super sandy, everything's mm. going right into our aquifers, yeah. um, and so, yeah. We have too much water yeah. with all of our roads <laughs> and they don't have enough. Alrighty, awesome. Cool. So people can make their own rain barrels if they want now, yep. if it's legal in your area. Yeah. All right, now is the fun part where we're gonna move down to the river. Yay. As soon as I get this bag on me. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, we'll go around this way. And since we're walking down right now, now's a good time if you happen to do have a question, you can ask during the walk. Oh. Also, uh, one area they banned it because of West Nile. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I know a lot of places. Um, I was in the Peace Corps in the Philippines, and um, we didn't really collect water there, um, but we always had buckets of water around for various purposes, and um, we always had covers on them. Uh -huh. to prevent mosquitoes from laying eggs well, in you, there. You said in the Philippines there were 30 different mangrove species. Over, or, over 30, yeah. Over so 30. technically I believe there's 47 mangroves and associated species. That's um, crazy. Yeah, and the mangroves there are super different too. Uh, really cool. I love them there. They were beautiful. So did you work, did you do mangrove stuff there too? Um, I was a coastal resource management specialist. Mm -hmm. um, so I did everything from from marine protected area management and strengthening um, to habitat assessments of corals, seagrass, and mangroves. Um, I also did a lot of community outreach. Mm -hmm. Fantastic community there. I miss the Philippines very much and all of my friends. Oh, we can. Do we want to touch on the A's? Yeah, we can talk about this real quick. All right. So we are at a spot known as the A's or ICE Lookout Point. Um, and it's named after kind of like the original people who lived in this area. I'm talking about three to 4,000 mm -hmm. years ago. And this uh, group of people was so intense, uh, fearsome, fearsome warriors, uh, that the larger tribes north of them and south of them didn't mess with them. Oh, wow. Um, and <laughs> it's estimated there was about 20,000 people. Um, and they uh, lived on the lagoon, uh, they ate the oysters, um, they ate uh, a lot of the different fishes. There's rumors that they ate the right whales. <laughs> yeah. Oh geez, they were vicious. Yeah, they were intense. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of really great history about them, so I highly recommend looking them up. All right, on the AIS. Yep. Yeah. And uh, they were named after the ch um, chief of that tribe. Mm -hmm. um, and this area, this entire Indian River right here, um, was originally named as the Ice River uh, oh, wow. by the Spanish. And then that's why it's called the Indian River now. Oh, I never knew that history. Yep. Speaking of uh, the Indian River, and I don't know if you've mentioned this on your streams before, but the Indian River is not a river. It's not a river. No, I don't know if you mentioned that yet. No, I yeah. haven't. Yeah. So the Indian River, the Banana River, and the Mosquito Lagoon all make up the entire Indian River Lagoon system. And even though they're called rivers, they're actually all lagoons. And a lagoon, oh bird, uh, a lagoon is a shallow body of water that is separated from the ocean by a barrier island, which you can see right out there. And they do, um, they get a lot of, um, they only get their water exchange really from the inlets. 
And even though the lagoon is 156 miles long, uh, there are only five inlets. So not a lot of water exchange. That's tough. And then we build these beautiful bridges. This one's done well, has good flow through it, but some of the bridges don't have great flow coming through and the few amount of inlets that could cause issues. Exactly. Some people say, well, why don't we just cut more inlets? That's not really going to be fixing the problem because we have so much stormwater pollution going into the lagoon. Yeah. More than five times the natural amount of stormwater is going into the lagoon. And because it doesn't have a lot of flow, it's kind of more of like a lake so that whatever mm -hmm. goes into the lagoon stays, stays in the lagoon. That's not good. Yeah. I heard they were thinking about building um, another outlet up by Patrick. There is talk of it again, but um, there has been other research by um, mm -hmm. FIT, Florida Tech mm -hmm. um, University, um, and they've done some modeling um, where they've seen that it's a very localized impact when they do cut an inlet, yeah. maybe about a five square mile area, which again, sounds big, yeah. but 156 miles. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's 75 miles between the two nearest inlets right here in this little patch. Yeah, that's crazy. Isn't it? Yeah. And overall, the lagoon is only about, um, I think at the widest area, the lagoon's five miles wide. Um, here it's about a mile-ish. Mm -hmm. um, swam across it before. Nice! <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. All and, right, we're going to go in the water now. Woohoo! Yep. Do we got to do the shuffle? Yep, you want to do the stingray shuffle? We do get some stingrays around here. Um, we saw about five last year during our summer camp, which was really cool for the kids. And you notice that there's not a lot of things we can see right now because we're kind of in the shallow spot. Um, but what I do want to point out is our beautiful mangroves on the shoreline right here. So these two close ones right here, to the one in the middle right there and the one right here, those are two that we planted. And about five years ago, this entire shoreline was barren. Oh, wow. Yep, it was full rock. Um, and then we got pretty destroyed by some hurricanes and we were able to get some funding so that we could uh, rehabilitate our shoreline by planting native plants. Oh, that's awesome. Yep. So, all right, pop question. What is this? Uh, red. Yes, <laughs> red <laughs> with the prop roots. And then this one down here is pretty wild. Yep. Because this one's like growing sideways and doing just fine. Yep, so this one is, this one had started to fall out. Um, mm -hmm. You can see that this was like the original portion right here. Um, but it, with all the heavy wave action we've had um, in the last, you know, couple of months, uh, it's kind of gotten washed out. But you'll notice that these beautiful prop roots are starting to grow and give it that stability. And it still has its leaves up here, mm -hmm. helping it photosynthesize. Ooh. Yep. And you'll see this green stuff kind of hanging out on the mangrove. A lot of people think that this is seagrass. It's not. This is a macroalgae. Oh, neat. Yep. And so uh, it's got a bunch of amphipods growing, <laughs> hanging out on it. You can see all these little guys. Gross. <laughs> not, my, <laughs> not my favorite. <laughs> um, but you can see that this provides a lot of habitat for a lot of different animals. However, it's not as beneficial as seagrass which is um, the building block for a lot of food chains in the lagoon. And actually, um, this past winter, we had a, a mass mortality event of manatees. Oh, no. In Brevard County, we had over 200 manatees die um, in the first three months of 2021. That's horrible. Was that nutrient related? Or? It was lack yeah. of seagrass, so lack of a um, sustainable f or a good food source for them to survive on. Um, there were so many dead manatees that uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife didn't have enough people or enough resources mm -hmm. to um, do necropsies to figure out why they died. But a lot of it was due to emaciation. Oh, wow, yeah. I, I, when I was out kayaking once down uh, Turkey Creek, I saw a dead one down there around that time. That's really sad. sad. Yep. So you may be wondering, what are these things right here? <laughs> <laughs> These are oyster prisms. Prisms, that's right. Yep, oyster prisms. They are a relatively new method of oyster restoration. 
Um, they have a kind of like frame on the inside. They are stuffed with oyster shell. And then that netting is known as jute that has been uh, dipped into cement and wrapped around. And what's really great is you can see that we've got some baby oysters growing. So what, why, why do oysters matter? Why do we make these oyster prisms? Oysters are super important for a variety of reasons. They help um, uh, remove uh, excess nutrients from the water. Um, they help kind of uh, prevent sediment as much from getting around. They provide more habitat. They provide the base um, for a lot of food chains, um, either by providing a nice stable environment for things to grow on top of the oysters, um, or different organisms uh, will eat the oysters um, as well. And then that kind of just is a building block of an entire habitat. How far down do these go? They go down. You can see that there is a lot of sediment kind of accreting yeah. behind them. Um, I want to say that they're about a foot by a foot by okay. a foot. Um, so they're about halfway buried. Prisms are a different technology than oyster beds? Correct. Okay. Yep. Oyster beds are going to be flat on um, the sediment, mm -hmm. kind of like these guys. Um, the idea about building these oyster prisms is to build them up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so in an ideal world, we'd mm -hmm. kind of like start layering them, um, but we only had the ability to do so many. That's yeah. awesome though. I didn't know there were now prisms, you know, locally you hear all about the the beds. Yep, and we're trying to remember. And then Hingo had a fish speared. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Yeah, there he is. No. Um, a lot of oyster restorations trying to remove, uh, move away from plastics. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because uh, you know, it's yeah. like, why are we in doing all this effort and then yeah. just introducing plastic into the environment by using um, oyster bags and things like that? So we're looking at a lot of different ways. Um, on our shoreline, you can see that we have some raccoon. Uh, paw prints in there. Um, we've got some, ooh, we got a horseshoe crab. Oh, no way. Um, exoskeleton, this is a horseshoe crab molt right here. I didn't even realize they molted. Yep, they will molt uh, about six to eight times or maybe even a little bit more, a little bit fewer during the mm -hmm. first year of life. And then uh, once they hit about three or four years old, they'll molt once a year. Uh -huh. And then uh, they'll reach sexual maturity at about 10 years and they live for about 20 years. And horseshoe crabs are super important um, for a lot of different things. They have mass spawning events where all their eggs are just kind of hanging along the shoreline and they provide a lot of food for migratory species. Oh, all right. Yep. Um, and then a lot of people, or a lot of people, um, their blood is super important um, in the medical industry. And there's even horseshoe crab blood harvesting what color is their blood? Blue. That's right. Yep. And their blood yep. is blue because it has copper in it. Yep. And ours is red because of iron. Exactly. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is a little horseshoe crab molt. Oh, neat. Yep. You can see the underside of it. This is where their legs go. They don't have any teeth. Um, so they'll actually crush like shells and worms against their body and then they'll move it towards their mouth. Um, they evolved over 450 million years ago um, and have been pretty much unchanged since then. So wait, sir. They're better than gators. Gators are like 220 million years old. So these ones are more dinosaurs. Yep. Well, gators aren't dinosaurs. That's a misconception. They're based. They're based. They're just from yeah. those eras. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I never knew 400, 450 million years. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah. They look kind of like trilobites. Yeah. If you look into them a little bit more too. And they're not technically crabs. We just call them crabs. Correct. So, they're yeah. more closely related to spiders. Oh, creepy. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> kind of cool. Yep. Let's see. What else do we got going on here? We've got... did have a question earlier, and you might have answered it when we talked about the mangroves. Uh -huh. How did the mangroves survive in the salt conditions as, like, a plant? Great question. So, um, mangroves have special adaptations that help them survive. I don't remember what plant that is. We looked it up <laughs> recently, but it's massive. You can see that it's growing right here on top of... Um, yeah, that's what I said. Was yeah. Ooh, are you going to pull out your iNaturalist thing? Yeah, I might be able to. Yeah. Um, so you... as you're doing that, um, so the red mangroves have a very special ability to exclude salt from mm -hmm. even entering their bodies um, through their properties. And then the whites and the black mangroves both excrete uh, salt through their leaves. So that's how they're able to maintain their osmoregulation or their balance yep, of salt in their bodies. That up there. Yep. We have it, the sea ox eye. Yep. Oh, look, there's a bee. Bees are very important. Yep. 
Did you know that the honeybee is actually not a native species to the United States? Did not know that. Yep. Uh, most of the native bees in the United States uh, are ground bees. They nest on the ground and not in hives. Oh, wow. Yep. So, this guy is known as a crown conch, and he's one of the most common species that we find along our shoreline in this area. Uh, and you can tell that he's the crown conch due to these little spikes on its shell. So it looks kind of like a crown. Sounds like little worms in there too. Yep, we got some little buggers. <laughs> and then here, that's his siphon. So that's how he's tasting the water um, and maintaining his uh, kind of like a body balance. And then right here, you can see that little piece of shell. That's actually part of his body. It's known as the operculum and kind of acts like a trap door. Oh, so neat. when he's feeling threatened, he'll pull in. And this little black and white part right there, that's his foot and that is what he uses mm -hmm. to move around. Neat. Yeah. Don't put him so uh, I asked this earlier, but the question came up again. If someone would like to volunteer, or I don't know if you have internships or things like that, what should they do if they are local? If they are local, definitely check us out on the web at savetheirl.org. Um, we are a little limited on our volunteer opportunities right now because of COVID. However, we do have a monthly uh, mangrove workshop um, that people are totally invited to participate in, but we, it is limited to about eight people, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, we also do outreach events um, where we talk to people about the importance of the lagoon and like what this. they can do to help. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're a little limited on our internships right now, but definitely always check us out online. Um, and also look around for your local nonprofits. We're always looking for help. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So any way you can help, I mean, Nicole's done an amazing job giving us some of her time today. I know we didn't do this as like an open fundraiser or anything like that, um, maybe in the future, but if you, you know, Thank you for being here. And also, if you do want to thank her and the MRC, go to the website and there's a donate button somewhere there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. you can help their conservation efforts for this beautiful area. Yeah. Because big picture, how does what we're doing here translate to the rest of the world? The issues that impact our lagoon are issues that impact many bodies of water throughout the entire world. Like I mentioned, stormwater pollution is a major contributor to the degradation of waterway habitats or water habitats or aquatic habitats. Um, so doing the little things, the little things that you can do to help reduce your impact on stormwater pollution is incredibly important. Um, like picking up your pet, picking up after your pet, making sure you're not leaving dog waste on the ground. Um, making sure that your grass clippings are being blown back onto your yard or being bagged or being used as compost instead of just letting your grass clippings go down the storm drain. Um, making sure that your trash is being properly taken care of as well. Recycling, reducing your use of plastics. Um, and if you fertilize, please don't. <laughs> um, we are definitely asking people to not fertilize during the fertilizer ban in uh, Brevard County. And that ban is from June 1st to September 30th. Um, and fertilizer in general has a, you know, a very significant impact on all waterways and aquifers. So yeah, this Definitely. right here is our breakwater and this is one of our other restoration methods. You can see that we've got a ton of rocks right out front. And you can see that we are starting to accrete some really nice sand here on the back. And a lot of plants have now been able to use this area as a new shoreline home. And this is going to help prevent coastal erosion. It's going to protect our shoreline from uh, stormwater surges and um, any kind of like hurricanes or big waves. Yeah, because just because we're inland here in the river doesn't mean we don't get storm surge. So storm surge, depending on which way the storm's coming, can come right up through the river and you can get a 10 foot storm surge on the river in a really bad hurricane. Definitely. So it's very important not to build on the riverbank. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, if you are building on the riverbank, maybe try to look into alternative methods um, mm -hmm. to protect your shoreline instead of building a seawall, which is actually going to erode your shoreline more. Um, consider using like maybe a revetment or a breakwater um, so that you are more naturally protecting your shoreline. So this is called a breakwater right here using rocks. Yep, just a bunch of rocks. Um, these are permitted. Um, it's also important that if you're doing anything that you're following the law and you're 
getting a permit. Don't just start throwing rocks in front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, you cannot plant or put anything into the water um, that is below the mean high tide. I think it's five, you have to plant above the, the mean high tide, I believe by five okay. feet almost. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so what we put down our sinks and accidentally dump into our yards that we think, ah, oh, it's gone, I don't have to worry about it now, actually could have severe consequences down the line. Exactly. And a dumb saying that rhymes but doesn't make any sense is dilution is the solution to pollution. It is not. Definitely <laughs> Don't not. say that. Yeah. Um, especially even things going down your sink. Yeah. Um, Florida's wastewater treatment plants, uh, you know, a lot of them need mm -hmm. to be updated. Um, things you should definitely not put down your drains, like oil, it can cause like conglomerations to like get together yeah. and cause a lot of issues for our uh, poor stormwater manage or our septic tanks and everything like that. Um, but yeah, any other questions? Yeah, is there anything to look out for with using street water runoff as lawn irrigation? Hmm, I Probably have- whatever's on the street. <laughs> yeah, I have not heard of that. Um, yeah. If you are using reclaimed water to water your grass, absolutely mm -hmm. do not fertilize. There's plenty of nitrogen and phosphorus in that reclaimed water. So you're yeah. just throwing money and time away if you fertilize your lawn. Ooh, good point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. Green grass doesn't mean everything. Yep. Dang HOAs. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's this beautiful green yeah. grass. Yes. Naturally produced green grass. Yep. Well, this is known as Spartina. It's um, a really important salt marsh grass. Um, it helps stabilize sediment. Um, and we've kind of noticed that when we have um, Spartina starting to grow, our mangroves start to grow better. Hmm. Yep. Maybe they're a good sign of the nutrient availability. Yep, so we got some mangroves right there. That's one of the red mangroves. Um, let's see, and then we've got a, ooh, here we go. All right, people out there, and whoa! <laughs> some kind of beetle. <laughs> All right. There's the W. Is that a W? Yep. Yeah, Here we go. They're all munched on a little bit. <laughs> so if you can't find the W, another thing to notice on these ones are these two little dots right there. Do you see it? It's kind of hard to see. Yeah, barely, yeah. Yeah. So those are nectaries. And um, it's theorized. Oh, you can see it on this one a little bit better. It's theorized yeah. that they produce a nectar that attracts ants to help protect this uh, tree from pests. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So Neat. kind of like a symbiotic relationship, which is yeah. kind of pretty cool. Oh. Neat. Yeah. Got another red mangrove over here. And so what's really amazing is that this has all grown within the last year or two. So oh, wow. before- just, be just because of the breakwater. Just because of the breakwater, yep. Um, this was actually just shoreline, just mm -hmm. water used to be all the way up to here. And over the last few years, this has all grown up. So yeah. Neat. Yeah. Amazing. So, and Any other questions? We went probably longer than what we planned, but you know, that's the nature of uh, Twitch and being excited about it. You show they all come in, you showed great enthusiasm. Uh, <laughs> You're a great teacher. Yeah, happy <laughs> oh, to talk about that. Where can someone get a rain barrel? Um, we sell them at, well, so if you're in Brevard County, um, we sell them at the Marine Resources Council. Uh, the rain barrels are $55 and they come with a three quarter inch spigot and the screen on top and then a tie around to uh, keep the mosquito screen on top. Mm -hmm. um, we do not sell the cinder blocks though or any kind of like attachments, um, but we're more than happy to walk people through installing the rain barrel at their house. So when they put it in, they should put it higher up on cinder blocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. You can also buy rain barrels at home improvement stores like Home Depot or Lowe's. Mm -hmm. um, and those are going to be a lot more expensive. They'll range from $80 to $150. And then you have to buy all the netting and all the other exactly. things. And things like but that. if you want to like jerry rig something, you can just get like a trash can <laughs> and like get a lid for it. And so there's lots of different things that you can do to build a rain barrel. But yeah, last, uh, oh look, there's a little mama duck. Yeah, I, I saw the yeah. little family over here. Yeah. Yep. Actually, when we did a live stream uh, earlier this week, I believe it was on Tuesday, we saw a manatee. 
Really? Yep, yep. Oh, man. Yeah, it was super cool. I saw it out of the corner of my eye, and then it swam away. Yeah. Oh, this is an interesting question. Is this your first experience with Twitch? It is my first experience with Twitch. You're, you're, you're a Zoomer. I'm, I'm a Zoomer. I do a lot of Zooming, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I haven't used... Oh, and so the, these are two breakwaters here. We have an additional two down that way, but you can see that our... Shoreline has done such a great job at building up. It's almost yeah. difficult to walk through it. Yeah, this is crazy. Isn't that? Do they use these breakwater things on beaches too? Or are they mainly rivers? They do use them on beaches offshore. I haven't looked into it yet, but I've heard that there's actually some quite large breakwater, not like they're not um, mm -hmm. emerged, they're submerged breakwaters way offshore, um, oh. kind of in satellite beach area. Yeah. And they put them in there to help kind of protect the shoreline. But the surfers have been a little pissed because it's changed the waves. Oh, poor surfers. I know. Well, so, <laughs> oh, there's like, you know, that difficult situation. It's like, you know, do we let nature do its thing or do we protect our shoreline that we spent billions of dollars maintaining? No. We protect the shoreline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, humans are really good at changing their environment. Um, so sometimes we have to put things back the way that they used to be. Osprey. Oh. oh. <laughs> Ospreys are awesome. Uh, they're incredibly great hunters. Um, they are monogamous and they mate for life. Um, you can find them up and down the Indian River Lagoon um, and throughout a lot of the United States as well. Um, but we have a very healthy population. Oh yeah. Yep. They return to the same uh, nest I think almost every year, you can see the bigger the nest, the longer that nest has been around. So kind of like eagles then, where they mm -hmm. build up on the previous year's nest. Yeah. And then you can see this black sediment on top. This is kind of like our mucky muck stuff. This is a lot of organic um, things that have kind of like broken down over time and has created like this black sediment. It clouds the water and prevents seagrass from photosynthesizing. Um, and it is the source of a lot of our problems. I was gonna say, yeah. when you first said it has a lot of nutrients or organics, that sounds good, but. After a while, so yeah. well, the lagoon was originally like kind of like a muck-based system a little bit, but over time, you know, it's gotten way too much. You can see the sharp contrast between oh, wow. the two. Yeah, so here's like our natural sand and then here's kind of more like that, you know, nasty muck stuff or darker sand. Wow. Yep. Well, all right, I don't think I should hold you all day. I could, we could be out <laughs> here for three hours and you won't be able to get any work done. <laughs> uh, oh, all right, oh. last thing. Last thing. That one. This one's got its legs. No, it doesn't actually have its legs, it's a molt. No. Here, let me rinse it out. Okay, so this isn't my fault then. No. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see the legs right here. Um, and like I said, once they get sexually mature about 10 years, the males will build, or build, uh, will start to develop these almost like um, boxing glove things. They look like big circles with little like hooks on them, completely just like boxing gloves. And they use that to clasp onto the females when they're mating. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they don't re reach maturity until 10 years old. Yeah. That's wild. Yep. I didn't know that. Yep. And like I said, incredibly important um, species for the entire world, or yeah, in the entire world. So their blood is used to uh, determine the, um, oh gosh, I haven't looked this up in a while, but their blood indicates if there's bacteria in a solution, it causes the solution to like coagulate and to kind of come together. Oh, interesting. And so if you have ever received a shot, you have benefited from horseshoe crabs. There you go. That's the importance of horseshoe crabs. <laughs> to humans. <laughs> yeah. Do we ever get mantis shrimp around here? I have no idea. Um, I believe, I think you can see them in more uh, offshore areas. You're not gonna find them in the lagoon to my knowledge. However, mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Um, you'll find them kind of offshore in like Stewart area, I believe. But again, that's, like my own personal experience. Yeah. Whether or not how accurate that is, debatable. Well, awesome. If there's any last questions, get them in now. If not, we'll start 
Ex remember everyone, exclamation point MRC. If you want to check it out, save the IRL.org. They do all this amazing stuff and they were kind enough to take some time out of their day and spend it with us so we can educate you all on the river and things you can do and things that are happening here to help protect this river, protect our manatees, protect everything living in here because nutrients are important and keeping them stable is important. Mm -hmm. And it took, you know, it took a hundred years to degrade the lagoon. It's going mm -hmm. to take a long time to get it back to health. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need everybody to come together to do their part to reduce their impact on stormwater pollution. But yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I don't think there's you. any last questions here. So we'll put this up with the bridge in the background. We'll do a little sign out, I guess. Cool. <laughs> so when are we coming back? That's the question. <laughs> Whenever you like. Uh, well, we do have summer camp coming up, mm -hmm. so we're going to be a little slammed. So um, at summer camp, are you building things like oyster bed or oyster prisms or anything like that? So our summer camp is going to be more of like an introduction okay. to all of the things Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, we have eight weeks of summer camp, four weeks of content that we're going to repeat twice. First one's going to be mini to macro, talking about all things in the lagoon and in Florida from mini to large. Next week is going to be home is your habitat, talking about all the different habitats mm -hmm. in Florida. And then it's going to be uh, earth to sky, talking about oh, wow. the geology all the way up to the sky and to the moon. And then the last one is going to be Florida past, present, and future, kind of talking about humans and our role with Florida. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, in the future, if you're doing like outdoor activities of building prisms, planting mangroves, it could be way less formal than this. Cool. And it's just me helping as like a volunteer and I happen to be streaming at the same time. I think that could be something cool. That could be awesome. Future. That might be a really yeah. great opportunity for yeah. you to attend one of our mangrove workshops. There we go. Yeah, yeah perfect. You're going to meet more of the MRC team. <laughs> How many are on the team? Uh, uh, us? Oh, yeah. oh gosh. I think we are a full-time staff of five people. Five people. Nice. Yeah, so save the lagoon. All the help they can get. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> five people are going to save the lagoon. Yeah, that's why we need your help. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, so I don't think there are any more questions. They're all saying thank you and they're very you know, right, happy for you your Thank you so much, guys. Yep. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being part of the first virtual field trip. Woo! Proof that we can use Twitch and this live streaming platform for amazing things like this. And... So, yes, thank you again for being here, and thank you so much, Nicole, for your time, and thank you to the MRC for everything you do for a river. I can come bird watching yeah. because of a healthy lagoon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and thank you so much, Wade. I really appreciate it, and thank you to everyone out there in the Twitch world. I hope you enjoyed our presentation <laughs> and learned about the amazing Indian River Lagoon. All right, thanks again. See you, everyone.